the title of the message for today is Stricken by God. After the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, some of the people who were behind the atomic bomb project exclaimed, what have we done? We now know evil and we cannot unknow it anymore. And Albert Einstein regretted for the rest of his life sending a letter to the US president urging him to consider the atomic bomb project, which started the chain of events that led to the development of nuclear weapons. I wonder if we were ever meant to split the atom. In the beginning, according to God's original plan, we were never meant to know evil, perhaps because once we know evil, we cannot unknow it ever again. I remember when I was a child, I broke a clock to see how it works. The only thing I remember was that some of the small parts would spin really well, like a spinning top. It was really exciting. Never mind the destruction. We as humans learn through dissection and destruction. But God never wanted us to acquire the knowledge of evil and in the process destroy this world. Long time has passed since Adam and Eve and until the time when we split the atom. But the principle of learning has not changed. We still learn through dissection and destruction. And perhaps because of this, God chose to allow us to dissect him on the cross. As it seems, this is the only way we can ever learn anything through dissection and destruction. And whether we speak of the creator or of his creation, the principle is the same. We have split, dissected, destroyed the atom to know it. And we have also split, dissected and destroyed God on the cross to know him. This is a part of our evil predicament, our nature that is both destructive of other things and self-destructive. But is this the nature of the creator also? I wonder why God told the King David, you cannot build a temple for me because you have spilled too much blood. And it seems that all the killing and the destruction in the Old Testament perhaps was not what God really wanted, even though it seems to look that way. The Apostle John makes this key statement in the opening chapter of his gospel. The only way we can know God, the only one way we can know God, we can truly know God is through his chosen servant, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Everyone else and everything else falls short and can be misleading and it can misrepresent the true nature of God. The book of Isaiah has a gradual buildup, starting in chapter 40, accelerating the good news, leading to the poem of the suffering servant of God in chapter 53. So today we will start in chapter 40, looking at this buildup. And I'm reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 6 to 10. Isaiah 50, verses 6 to 10. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that it will not be a shame. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord 
and rely upon his God. Now, while the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 applies this text to all of us, saying, if God is with us, who will stand against us or who will condemn us? Now, the original context of this passage applies this statement specifically to the servant of God, the Messiah, who would allow people to strike his cheek, to pluck his beard and spit on him. And even though he would allow himself to be humiliated, ultimately, the Messiah would not be disgraced because God would help him and exonerate him. And following this, all those who fear the Lord and all those who live in darkness and have no light are called to trust God and rely on him and obey his Messiah. I'm moving forward into chapter 51, reading verses 3 to 5. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. The message of comfort to Zion and the people of God. And here we have a hint pointing to the restoration of the Garden of Eden, its environment and the conditions of the original God's will that includes life eternal. And there is the extension of this promise to all nations. God's light will shine to all nations, coastlands, faraway lands. This is the mission of the Messiah. Then verse six in chapter 51, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. The complete future restoration will not only reestablish the Garden of Eden conditions on the earth, even the heavens are affected by this restoration. This will all pass away, the old order of things. And the only thing that will remain forever is God's salvation that will be accomplished through the work of God's servant, the Messiah. And what follows in the next two chapters is a detailed description of the character and nature of God's servant, the Messiah, and of his work. So we are moving on to chapter 52. Verses 13 to 15, chapter 52, 13 to 15. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. The Messiah will cause everyone to look at him with astonishment because of the manner of his appearance, his appearance and the way he looks. The rulers of the world will see in him something that has never been seen before and will hear things they will never, they've never heard before. Then we have this statement, he will sprinkle many nations. He will sprinkle many nations. And the Hebrew word for sprinkle, if you read it in the Hebrew Bible, is used only 22 times in the Old Testament. And, and in 20 out of 22 cases, it refers specifically to ceremonial cleansing. And chronologically, the last time this 
word is used in the Old Testament is in the book of Isaiah. And in previous 19 times, it always refers to the clean, cleansing of the Israelites. In Isaiah, this is the only time in the Old Testament that this word refers to the ceremonial cleansing of all nations, other nations. So Isaiah is introducing something new, he is unpacking the plan of God, dealing with the restoration of the Gentiles, all nations, the entire earth. And with the next verse, we enter Isaiah chapter 53. 53.1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Here the Messiah is pointing out to the futility of his work, wondering why so many reject him. Why so many reject him? Next verse, verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is the image of the servant of God from Isaiah 11, where he is described as a shoot, as a new sprouting branch that emerges from the root of David. What about his self-presentation? With him, there is no stately form, there is no majesty, beauty. He is stripped of all things considered attractive by the standards of this world. There is nothing externally attract attractive about him. Nothing externally attractive about him. What makes him unique and special is within him, his true identity. And this is the greatest mystery of all. Next verse, 53 verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, we did not esteem him. Despised and rejected of men. He is the man of suffering, acquainted with grief, acquainted with the human condition, its sorrow and pain. He allows himself to take upon himself the, suffering, the sufferings of others to such extent that it is unbearable to watch. So people turn their faces away. If you constantly observe people in pain and suffering, how much of that do you take upon yourself? Where do you draw the line? People who work in caring professions have to think in terms of self-care. Otherwise, you just burn out. But with this suffering servant of God, the line of distinction between his own sufferings and the sufferings of others has been blurred to such an extent that it is almost invisible. Even the best of us, after our work, we go home. But as Christ said, foxes have holes and birds have nests. But I have nowhere to rest my head, no shelter to protect me. Reading the next two verses, 53 verses 4 and 5. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Why is he suffering so much? Clearly, he does not deserve this. 
perhaps God is punishing him for some reason. We consider him smitten by God. We thought he was stricken by God. But this was our assumption and perception. Something else is going on here. This statement highlights a fundamental misunderstanding of what happened on the cross. And this is the key image that causes misunderstanding. We have God up there punishing his servant down here. That's the image. Now, the prophetic story of the coming Messiah gradually builds up in the book of Isaiah from chapter 40 to chapter 53. There are a couple of verses here and there describing the character and work of the Messiah. But when you get to chapter 53, there is a culmination and the whole chapter is dedicated to him. It becomes clear that he is the suffering servant. But, but this prophetic story opens in Isaiah chapter 40 and is announced by the one crying out in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord. The one who is coming is the Lord himself, Yahweh, the Old Testament Lord with capital L-O-R-D. It is God himself that ends up on the cross. This is the Lord from the book of Isaiah who repeatedly reminds us dozens of times, I am the Lord, your only savior. There is no other savior but me. None but me can save you. As you fast forward, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, the Apostle Paul claims, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not God was out there. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And the fundamental misunderstanding of the cross expressed in Isaiah 53.4 portrays the image of God up there punishing his servant down here. But what is really going on is that God from up there has himself descended down here and allowed us to crucify him, put him on the cross. God was in Christ on the cross, reconciling the world to himself. And in this context, we read Isaiah 53 in a different light. When we read the words, we thought he was smitten. We consider him stricken by God. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, put him to grief. When we read these words, we need to keep in mind that it was the Lord himself, Yahweh. The Lord himself was hanging on the cross. So whatever was happening externally on the cross was enveloped in misunderstanding. That's the sentiment Isaiah 53.4 shares. But what was happening internally in Christ on the cross was shrouded in mystery, the greatest mystery of all. And what is helpful to do is to distinguish Christ from the cross, distinguish Jesus from a piece of wood. The cross is the sign of what we see merely externally. It is the sign of the wicked people who have given false witness and have unjustly mistreated Jesus and tortured him and murdered him. And for this, they will receive their just reward at the second coming of Christ. A revelation tells us, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye shall see him, even they who pierced him. We are not saved by the cross, but by the person who hung on the cross. The mystery of salvation lies not in the external visuals of the cross, but in the internal experience of God himself in the form of man hanging on the cross. And here is the 
incomprehensible mystery that no one will ever understand how in this one person that is both God and human, God, can, God has reconciled humankind back to him. The scriptures tell us that even angels desire to look into these things. But not even angels can comprehend it. That is really the point of, of the angels fixed above the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, staring down onto it, trying to understand what's going on. The only one who knows and understands and comprehends what actually happened on the cross is Jesus Christ, God himself in flesh. And it is the mystery that will remain in him and with him forever. It is his private data, not shared and not accessible to anyone else. Never mind the exalted angels who are mentally and spiritually far superior to us. When we attempt to comprehend what happened in the person of Christ on the cross, you're way over our heads. Isaiah 55 tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So here we stand, faced with the Lord God himself, crucified, on the cross, looking at you and me from the cross. And as we look back at him on the cross, what is our response to him? 